All right, so the Sign Mike stage, we are talking to scientists all day today and tomorrow. And right here I have Dr. Quinn Nitaket, a uh, Macmore, and uh, Lamore, and I have Dr. House Lynn. And we're gonna be talking about misinformation, which we all know about in our hearts. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to talk, I'm going to let you house t um, talk first about what is your area of research and what are you going to talk about um, in your session? Bo you're, you're both in the same session, right? Yeah. Tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. So what is your topic? Yeah, so I'm a computational social scientist. And for the last couple of years, I've been trying to understand misinformation, why people share it, and and you can and, have yeah. the mic a little bit closer yeah. up here, so just yeah. we can, there why we go. why people share it, and what can we do to reduce the spread? So, and, and I think like what we said, you know, misinformation, unfortunately or fortunately for for us, you know, I don't have to actually explain why it's an issue. Yeah. Right. So. Well, um, you could give us give give us one like the best like example. You kind of like you're at a dinner party and you're like. This is an example that you might have heard of, of misinformation. I think it's pretty obvious. You know, it, it's like, I think the example that we always give is the elections, right, of 2020 and, and the pandemic. I think that really solidify, you know, to, to everyone, the public, everyone, academics, everyone, literally technology companies that, oh, this is a problem. We need to do something about it, right? The, 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 the pandemic, basically. Yeah. Right? So I, I think, and, and there's a lot of pressure since, you know, 2016, the first election where Trump, you know, was involved. But but in the last eight years or so, I think there's just been so much research on it and, and pressure on technology companies to come up with solutions. And that pressure actually led them to, you know, develop or oh, come up with interventions and, and ways of reducing misinformation online. And the, the, the current state of the art are so-called, you know, content-specific solutions that, you know, you can see on the slides on the left-hand side, right? And, and they, they just require a lot of manpower, fact-checking, and machine learning classifiers. It's very, very effective, right, if you can get them to work, right? But th th there's a huge limitation, and that's my research in the last few years. What can we do to address these limitations, right? The, the limitation here is about coverage and speed, Right? There's so much content being generated every single minute or even second. Right? What can we do? Right? There's just so many humans that can go around fact-checking every piece of content, and there's only so many, so much algorithms that we, we can have right, to, to, to fact-check everything. So, so we decided to come up with these kinds of new interventions that cost content-neutral interventions that don't require you to identify, oh, what are the kinds of content that people are sharing that are fake? So it's contrasting these two approaches, content-specific, this is content neutral. And so can you explain real quick what do you mean by content neutral? You mean like you don't have to find a specific instance of misinformation yeah. to address it. These are yeah. general things that we should be doing in society. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's a really interesting approach that, that we've been working on for many years and there's so much evidence that we would build up over the years now. But what's lacking is the scalable field evidence from actual social media platforms. Like basically it just involves, you know, I study decision making, I build computational models, and I've realized that often people have really good intentions. Most people actually care a lot about sharing accurate content online. They care. If you ask them, about 95% of people can care about it. Yeah. It, but what is going on is that on social media, right, it's a really distracting environment, and the algorithms are promoting uh, really a engaging, sensational, and viral content that it kind of makes you forget that you actually care about accuracy. So can we do something oh. to leverage that? Right, so and the solution that we came up with was very simple, so simple that you think, why didn't I think of that, right? It's yeah, remind people to think about accuracy, that's yeah. it. Before, right? before we go to the slide though, I wanna, uh, Dr. McLemore, like do you have anything to add? Because he's talking about like misinformation versus disinformation, can, so can you kind of talk about that? I can, yes, um, okay, so misinformation is sharing information accidentally that may not be true. Intentionality is not assumed. Pretty much everyone does this at least once if you're online in any degree of time. Disinformation is not like that. Disinformation is when bad people go online with a very specific agenda and decide actively to manipulate the truth or misrepresent it or lie for a specific aim. So the difference between misinformation and disinformation in the context of some of the things I might look at would be Misinformation would be if a well-intentioned parent of a gay kid shared information online showing that 
gay parents were worse at parenting than straight parents wanting to get guidance on how to address that when their kid had kids. This information is the guy who wrote that fake paper to begin with. His name's Mark Regnerus. <laughs> wow, that's very specific. <laughs> No, it's, but it's it's very important. Like, I think uh, Dr. Lin is talking about this idea of, like, it's, like, the system itself, right? The social media platform is helping with the dis misinformation, but disinformation is very targeted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's actually, let's talk about misinformation first, and let's talk about, uh, let's kind of go to your slides, Lynn. So you have, like, you talked about how there is some solutions that are, like, kind of common sense that you hadn't thought of. Can you give us some examples of those? Yeah, so, so like what we said, lots of people care about sharing accurate content online. If you ask them in, in surveys, more than 95% of people said, you know, I, I want to share only accurate content online. But surprisingly, you know, they, 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 which, when you actually show them content online, they, uh, on social media platforms, they actually will share them. And you ask them why, they forget. They forget that, oh, I, I forget got to consider whether this is accurate or not. I think most of us can actually relate to that. When you're scrolling on social media, do you yeah. actually think, oh, is this accurate? No, right? That, that's not what you think about. It's it, that extra step right? that is intuitive. Right. What, what were you going to say? Sorry. Oh, no, nothing. Oh. I was just... <laughs> yeah. Agreeing. Yeah. Yes. So, so I just want to quickly, you know, you know, just highlight the intervention that we came up with and what we did, just really simple. We decided to just scale up the, the intervention on Facebook and Twitter. So we ran really large, hundreds of thousands and millions of users, you know, and targeted them with ads, digital ads. Okay. Ads are often used to sell products, but we decided why not You're use sell truth sell truth or not truth you know you sell sell more of a way of thinking okay so a way of thinking because truth can get you know who, who decides what is truth oh right no. that that's the problem in this field maybe sell that extra step exactly so and then we did that and then I can show you so what yeah. we did was just to identify a lot of people users on Twitter or Facebook that share a lot of misinformation so those are you know you can see on panel a and then we, we then uh, put them you know, in so-called custom audiences, and basically we can target them with ads on, on Twitter or Facebook. And then we ran campaigns for up to three weeks you know, and s measured exactly what people are sharing during those three weeks. And then what we find incredibly is that, yeah, we reduced sharing by about 6.3% how much wow. misinformation they're sharing. So this is actual behavior. So this is the first time there's any evidence, you know, to, uh, from a field experiment that w there's an intervention that's highly scalable and that you can deploy it to lots of people at the same time wow. easily. And it also actually reduces sharing behavior, not just intentions. Because previous work has all been, you know, on intentions. Oh, do you think you would share this online? So it's pretty, you know, incredible. So all, all people needed was a reminder. Yeah. So <laughs> it just means that a lot of people. It's basically consistent with theorizing. You know, lots of people are sharing misinformation online because they're misinformed, they're distracted. Obviously, we're not going to try to target the people like what, what, you know, who are deliberately trying to share this information. Right. right? Those are the purveyors of it. But there are also people who are just scrolling quickly, got distracted. So we're trying to target those kinds of people. And yeah, so we, 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 we're we really excited about this finding and trying to you know, convince social media platforms. In fact, this project, uh, this uh, Facebook study was done with Facebook in collaboration with them. Oh, right? the wow. Twitter okay. study was, yeah, we, we independently done it. And the <laughs> designs were very different. So for us as academics, we're really excited about findings because it was implemented very differently, like the way the study But it was, was still but consistent. But the results were very consistent across wow. like, the two studies. So we're really excited about that. You know, it's the first evidence of scalability uh, and, and real sharing behavior. Yeah. And something actually doable. So yeah. now let's go from misinformation to disinformation when things are very focused. So look, next slide. Um, well, I guess we can do that. Anyway, uh, you got it. Uh, that's the wrong one. Uh, that one. That yeah. one, yes. Oh, what? somebody's helping. Yes. OK, so let me begin by posing a question to folks that may be watching or listening. 95% of scientists agree that climate change is real and man-made. What? immediate question pops into your head when I give you that figure? The 99%. Yeah. Who, yeah. yeah. Who are the there. other ones? Who the heck are they? Because yeah. here's the thing. Sometimes it's a sad truth. Disinformation comes from inside the house. It's not just that scientists need to get their message out there better. No, it's that sometimes there are people with credentials inside a scientific system that will participate in the generation of disinformation and essentially launder disinformation 
through a veneer of science. We've seen this with climate denial. We've seen this with t the tobacco industry. And we've seen this most recently, at least in what I study, when it comes to social issues involving gay kids and most recently trans kids. Because on that side of the board over there, top right corner, there is a quote from, re from former Justice Antonin Scalia in which he defended Oof. keeping gay marriage illegal in the United States because evidence from studies showed that gay parents were worse at raising kids than straight parents. And what the author of that study had actually done was took an $800,000 grant from the Witherspoon Institute, a right-wing anti-gay think tank affiliated with multiple hate groups that you also see listed there, including the American College of Pediatricians, a group which only existed from breaking up from the American Academy of Pediatrics because the AAP said gay adoption was okay. They made this study, yeah. biased it by getting the most dysfunctional gay parents they could find and comparing them to the most idyllic straight people they could find. And then years later, what I'm talking about on my talk, more or less the same thing happened, but without even the right-wing money mm. when it came to trans kids and the concept of rapid-onset gender dysphoria, a concept which originated by studying no children whatsoever, but by asking parents in multiple forums opposed ideologically to their kids transitioning about their estranged children and why they thought their kids became trans. Oh, no. And this is the number one most cited document by expert witnesses in court cases defending bans on gender affirming care. That was a lot to rush out, but I will shush now. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, I mean, you're, you're saying that there are people that are putting out these scientific papers that are cherry picking their data. Cherry right? picking their data and also informing the participants in the case of ROGD of the hypothesis. The recruitment ad literally tells them what they're trying to do. And oh, worse than that, it was actually promoted in right-wing newsletters like National Review and on groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom site while the study's data collection was ongoing. They actually linked back to the study so you could take it after you read the story, which assumed that it was real. Okay. Wow. And, and you're saying, like, these studies are being utilized. So that's the next slide, right? Yeah. These studies are being extensively utilized. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> it's all right. Okay. It, it's going to be fixed. All right. I can't see very much right yeah. now, but I swear I thought this there. would look bigger. <laughs> no, there it is. Okay. So here's the thing. I did some work with the Southern Poverty Law Center reading through every expert deposition an expert to witness testimony from the four longest running cases in which the state had to defend bans on gender affirming care for youth. And I found a few things that were interesting. First, all of them cited more or less the same pieces of evidence for the same arguments. That paper I discussed was their number one most cited source. Much of the rest of the sources were commentaries that they themselves had written in sympathetic journals that they were on the editorial boards of. And here's the thing, though. A significant portion of the core references that they relied on also appeared on an internal list from one of these groups, the American College of Pediatricians, that they used to explicitly tell their members how to scientifically argue against transition care from a perspective without sounding too religious. And so if you compare the overlap, that's the yellow dots on the screen, of those references to the references in that internal document, you will see that there is a significant portion that overlap, not the least of which because a number of the expert witnesses, including Paul Hrues, most notably, were members of that group. Mm. So here's the thing. This is all very policy-based and talks about what will affect lobbyist groups and politicians seeking to justify policies they want to do. But what House looks at is what individual people will do. So yeah. in terms of where I'm going next, I do want to shout out the right-hand side of that slide. I know we're short on time. It's about how we try to see whether this strategy works on lay people. And I have both good news and bad news. Okay. Hit us with the bad news first so we can end on the good. The bad news is that People don't actually seem to care whether a person conveying information to them about gender-affirming care has a degree or not. So what we did in this study is we got a bunch of participants on Prolific, an online sampling platform. Okay. We balanced them by political affiliation, and we measured them before and after giving them misinformation. We told them false information, and the information was allegedly conveyed by either a professor or a layperson. 
And here's the thing. Mere exposure to the misinformation made them actually get a 10% lower score on average on a true-false quiz that they themselves had taken a week before and endorsed conspiracy theories more, and it did not make any difference whatsoever whether the person had formal expertise or not. Yeah. But the good news is, it doesn't make any difference whether the person has formal expertise or not. So if a person <laughs> is a hack who goes up to launder their stuff through a scientific journal, that doesn't seem to give it much credentialing or impact with people. Instead, this information susceptibility seems to be rooted in individual differences in motivated cognition. My colleague, Catherine Wall, I actually listed here, looks into this much more than I do, but she has a model that's beginning to look into how individual people have a, what motivations contribute contextually to this specific domain. Layer that on top of the stuff that House looks at more generally and apply that to social media and there is a way up. Expertise on the part of people spreading the disinformation should not interrupt that. If, of course, this replicates. If my follow-up study completely fails to replicate this, forget <laughs> everything I just said. <laughs> but so, I mean, so both of you, let me just sum up, both of you are pretty optimistic. You think that something, intervention can work. What would you say? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's you more a matter <laughs> of, well, okay, so I want to couch this with a little asterisk. For the people that are deeply motivated and committed to engage in misinformation, the point of the misinformation is not persuading them to change their mind. It's giving them justifications to continue believing what they already believe. But these are a minority of people kicking around on social media. For your average person, just reminding them to value accuracy seems to remind them that they should value accuracy. So it's a difference between committed serial consumers of this who want it for another reason or an ulterior motive and what we might call normal people. The audience. Yeah. They consume it. Yeah. And it produces. Yeah. I'm going to leave this conversation knowing that if I, people are just reminded to be more skeptical, yeah. they will be. Is that, you think so? Yeah, yeah, I think we got to be very careful about the terminology, skeptical. Or okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. help yeah, me with that. Before we get into that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah what, would you, what would you say then? more be more discerning. Discerning. Right, because skeptical uh, I I in academic jargon, it means you just distrust everything. <laughs> okay, including, okay. Including false information. More discerning of... Including true information. Okay, yeah. how would you, I'm going to give you the last word then, how would you say... Um, Reminding people to, like, can you say that again? Reminding people to think about the quality of the content that, that they're looking at. Just activating the construct of accuracy. So that, that's, that works quite well for consumers. But I, I doubt it will work for producers, you know, people <laughs> who are actively trying to produce content. But there's more yeah. consumers than producers. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Which is good. All right. Thank you, too, for coming to talk to me yeah. about misinformation and disinformation. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. That's the last one for today. Come back tomorrow. Yeah.